You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Boss Hog Liberty Podcast. This is episode number 78 of East Central Indiana's favorite podcast. I'm Jeremiah Morrill, and today I'm joined by co-host Dakota Davis. In today's episode, we are featuring guest uh, Donya Lester from Purdue University. Well, formerly of, of Purdue. Yeah, formerly, formerly of Purdue. Formerly of Purdue University. Well, you know, she still has the email. <laughs> and then uh, we also, of course, have Chase Payton. Uh, he is a, he's a guest host today. And uh, today we are going to be talking all about government involvement in universities around the United States, also the government's involvement in agriculture, and uh, if there are any free markets left in the world of agriculture. And then as we get to the end, we are going to be uh, keeping with our local roots and talking about some uh, sidewalk drama and, uh, and uh, movie theater drama. So. There we go. Stick with us. So this show is about our lives in rural Indiana. As always, we promise our episodes are going to be fun and an easy listen. Uh, we have sponsorship opportunities to go to. We're in the new studio, and we got we got rent. That's right. Yeah, we got we got some rent to cover now. We got uh, all things going, all kinds of good things happening. So, uh, if you are a business owner and you would like to have your business featured on the mysterious garage door behind us, then uh, we can put we can make that happen. Uh, so just contact Jeremiah or myself, and uh, we'll get you we'll get you hooked up. We could go week to week. Just just spitballing here. And right now we're at zero dollars a week. So yeah. it could be like a rolling bidding average. You know, <laughs> somebody offers me two dollars next week, your logo could be back there in front of hundreds and hundreds mm. of five viewers. I like it. Or can thousands. We, can we rent out each individual square? We could, maybe? We could be like NASCAR where it says Unical and se- Philly seventy six <laughs> and Ray Bestis. We can have them all up there. That's and right. You'll sound if like I, Ricky if I Rudd give you after a dollar. Somewhere. Will you put my shirt back there? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. maybe a dollar, perhaps a dollar fifty. If you cover 50. one month's rent, we can make that happen. Ooh, we'll talk two dollars. <laughs> we, we should have these negotiations <laughs> privately. Yeah, Chase so, drinks Gatorade on every show, so maybe we should have a Gatorade sponsorship. I could, I could deal with that. Yeah, you could. Could you make that happen? For I us? can make that happen. All, all right, right, all right. Well, you're going to be director of sales and marketing shortly. <laughs> uh, and then, if you are uh, a monthly contributor to the show in our what we call Patreon, that's the uh, the group of folks that get special access. They get insider <sighs> information, extra shows, all kinds of. Uh, they get the show notes ahead of time, so they have a, they have a clue as to what we're actually talking about. You got a special show. It's in your feed today. Did that's you guys right. record yeah, it? Yeah, we recorded. Uh, we 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 recorded last night. Um, and that is tinfoil time with my wife and I, and we talk about conspiracy theories. My wife is a research scientist, and she likes doing research. And uh, last night— She's really a scientist already? Yeah. That's, she's been uh, there like three days. Well, she got the title of that's scientist? That's her official title, man. She's, man. she's serious in this, in this world. Yeah, so I'm married to a scientist now. You married now. And uh, so to celebrate her job as a research scientist, uh, we— we covered the topic of big pharma and whether or not the government is hiding the cure for cancer from us. So it was a it was a good one. Uh, she talked she talked me up and down. She knew a lot I'm, more than what I did. I'm going to say government is wildly inefficient and they're not hiding the cure for cancer. <laughs> from you. I'm just I'm just going to guess. <laughs> but hey, I, they have I have not sign, listened yet. Don't, don't I'm guessing. Don't ruin it. They have to sign up for the Patreon. I haven't to know heard it. That. I haven't seen it. This is just my uneducated opinion, but. I am I a think Patreon member. Yeah, of course you, you think do. That, <laughs> of course you do. Chase. Of course you do. <laughs> of course you do. Chase, once again, if you are in the podcast uh, world, he is wearing his Wind Farms Are Cool pinwheel shirt. Um, you really just want you just want to. I think we should start again. selling them on online. Sailing them? Yes. Like with with I don't sailboats. Have, I don't have earphones, Dakota. I can't hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> But if uh, if one more person joins the Patreon, we will buy to, we will buy Chase a a set of earphones, and we will name them after you. So they will the Chase Payton earphones. We, no, we don't name them after you. We'll name them after the next Patreon subscriber. Oh, so Dennis Free just logged in to watch Sherry Sh- Conover Charlotte up in Marion, Indiana. Just uh, just jumped in. Uh, I'd wear Dennis on my ears. Yeah, we'll 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 put the sponsor logo on there. Little picture of Dennis. I like it. Why not? 
I like that. All right, we've made we've made poor Danya sit here long enough watching <laughs> watching the awkwardness. I I've known Danya for three years now. I think something like that. Coming up on like our thousand day friendship anniversary. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping she gets me something. Uh, How creepy! Oh yeah, I, I just did the math. <laughs> I, I do creepy really well. Have you met me? Yeah, um, I have. Yeah. So Danya had worked for Purdue University in the in her role. I was I've been with P. Carrot for a few years at the state level, and Danya would come into our meetings and give presentations on government relations, uh, and we'd be Facebook friends and have followed each other. And so I've I've kind of watched what Danya does, and it, the, I'm sure the exposure that I've had is a very small part of what Danya actually was responsible for at Purdue. But I thought Danya would be a great guest to bring on the program. And now that she's recently retired, the gloves are off and she can speak freely <laughs> about the uh, about the education system and, and, and her role. Uh, so first, we want to welcome you Thank to the you. show. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank. Well, and you're uh, you still live up in uh, in northwestern Indiana or is it, west what, central, west central. That's what west we call it. So we, we're east central yeah. and you're you're northeast northwest central almost what is, what is west it's, central is that Terre Haute? no um i'm in montgomery county uh just, okay. north, just north of crawfordsville about, right. there you go. so that is west central you're just off i-74 yeah. you're right mm-hmm. just eight miles north of i-74 not not that we were doubting you or anything <laughs> don't ever do that <laughs> we're doing we're, we're, there's a bunch of bridge work going on on i-74 over there oh, uh yeah. and uh that's me that's my fault Oh, okay. I'm, I'm supplying that. So when it goes terribly wrong, that's, that's why I went on 32 today, that's right. and that's why I had all the traffic on 32. <laughs> it's okay. Chase was late, so so your uh, your accent is not I'm not not, from, not native to. You're not from around here, is you? <laughs> South of 40. <laughs> South of 40. That's what my folks always tell me. No, I I grew up uh, in Northwest Georgia, a little town called Cedar Town. And uh, was educated uh, in Georgia. I went to Berry College, a little uh, private uh, college in in, uh, northwest Georgia for my freshman year, then transferred to the University of Georgia, uh, majored in agriculture there and animal science. And then I went to another land-grant university, to Virginia Tech, and got a master's degree there. So um, I spent a good portion of my life. My first job was in Texas. So I've uh, spanned the breadth of the South uh, so you may pick up lots of different accents uh, for me. I, I, I've amalgamated a lot of things over the years uh, from where I've been. Do you say wash or wash? Uh, I say wash. <laughs> so it's two syllables. I don't say either one of those. <laughs> what state has the best food? Oh, my. Um, really put I, mi- I really missed uh, Tex-Mex when I left Texas. Texas really is serious about good food. And mm. so that I missed that food, but I like spicy. And so that's why Midwestern cuisine's not really great for me because, um, you know, black pepper is Be- spicy yeah. because, for the yeah. Midwest. Mayonnaise <laughs> for people is spicy here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Because so. our signature dish gets mayonnaise, tomatoes, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and lettuce on a, on a tenderloin. Right, right. It's, so... Yeah, except for uh, I guess the the one Midwesterner we know that uh, really loves spicy stuff would be <laughs> Mr. Darren Jacobs. Yeah, um, he brought ghost peppers on the show a few oh weeks my. ago. And oh, we, no, I can't it was do really those. bad. I can't do those. Yeah, we have a live. We had a uh, a I recording of it. Yeah, I want to live. Yeah, the so end of se- the end of September was uh, was our ghost pepper episode yeah. and <laughs> um, August. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Wow, we're, <laughs> it, 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 it ruined a part of my brain that will never come back. <laughs> it's already blocked from his memory. It'll never come <laughs> back. Had to go to therapy. So, Donya, you were at. Uh, you said you were in Texas, and it had something to do with cows. I, I want to say that Dakota goofed up because it says you that you were at the Brangus Breeders Association. Mm-hmm, that's is that, correct. It's not Angus. It's mm-hmm. Brangus. Brangus. Brangus is an American breed. Um, which um, is a three-eighths Brahmin, five-eighths Angus. Um, it, it was called a, a synthetic breed. Um, it followed the the pattern that was set by the King Ranch when they developed the Santa Gertrudis cattle. They used a shorthorn for the, the five-eighths portion and the Brahmin for the three-eighths. And the reason being in that Gulf Coast uh, climate down there um, that uh, a lot of... Um, we called eared cattle, um, the uh, the Brahmin cattle, the Zebu cattle, um, have a lot of advantages in terms of their survivability of that climate. They mm. don't grow as much hair, for one thing. And you're worried uh, about the cows overheating, basically. Yeah. So it, they well, and they just um, you know they they're adapted differently to. Uh, uh, the forage conditions, all kinds of things down there. So the the thing was to get an optimum amount of the zebu cattle in them, 
so that they had that um, adaptability to the climate and to the environment, but then to have enough of what we call the English breeds, the Angus, the Hereford, the Shorthorn, those kind of breeds, uh, to have the, the uh, carcass quality that we wanted uh, so that they would marble well and that they would grow well, all of those kinds of things, and the milk production of the cows, that, that sort hmm. of thing. So Carcass quality is what you call, is that like the quality of the meat that you get correct. out of? Okay. Correct. So I got to be honest with you, before um, I started researching for this episode and I saw that you worked at the the Brangus Breeders Association. Mm-hmm. Are we saying that right? Brangus? That's correct. Okay. So Brahma I, and Angus combined. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I used to, uh, I used to play uh, this video game called Fallout. Uh, yeah, have you ever played it? <laughs> I played it a couple times. Probably okay. Not, not where Donya thought her evening was going. Yeah, probably not. But I know before, nothing about video games. I'm, I'm totally this out of my own So <laughs> Fallout is about this post-apocalyptic world, and uh, you're trying to survive, and they have cows, and the way that they label the cows is Brahmin, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of other sci-fi things thrown in. And mm-hmm. before this episode, I had no idea that Brahmin was an actual cow that and it wasn't just made up by the producers of the video game. No, that, they, that's me coming clean. The International Brahma, <laughs> Brahmin Breeders uh, Association, the IBBA, is located in uh, or used to be in Houston, Texas. So wow, and you were mm-hmm. you were pretty close in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Is it yeah. pretty close? I have no idea. No, uh, I mean, it, nothing's close in Texas. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> and San Antonio is right in the middle. So it was it was you know several hours from Houston. Well, it's not very close. And then from there, you went back home. At, at, well, yes, so, somewhere yes. in there, you went back yeah, to I went, Georgia. Yeah, went back to the University of Georgia and uh, worked for the College of Agriculture there for four years. Did all kinds of stuff for them. I went there uh, as a fundraiser, and then my job morphed while I was there into um, an alumni relations uh, student recruitment position. So I was actually, I had a split appointment, so I had two offices in the same building and uh, on different floors. <laughs> Interesting. Before lunch, I'm on the third well, floor. After lunch, I'm on the seventh floor. Oh my gosh, it was crazy. And then, uh, well, that was before we had email. And so actually I had uh, had mailboxes in two buildings on campus. And <laughs> so that was crazy. But um, so I did, I did a lot of things for the College of Agriculture there. And then um, uh, through that job, I got involved with the National Professional Organization for folks who uh, do alumni and fundraising for colleges of agriculture across the country, the National Association, uh, the National Agricultural Alumni and Development Association, NAADA, NADA. Hmm. And uh, uh, one of the founders of that group was Maury Williamson, who happened to have been my predecessor at, at Purdue, Purdue in my ag alumni role, which is not the role that Jeremiah knows me from. But uh, my ag alumni role is the role I came to in 1990 when Maury retired. And um, so it was really he had developed the Ag Alumni Association there into an incredible uh, volunteer support organization for so, the college. And Maury was an East Central Indiana guy. You betcha. He was right West, over here in economy. Yeah, yeah, not, not too no, far. 15, yeah. 20 minutes away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how does how does one get involved in a in this a school of agriculture? Like, so you obviously worked in agriculture. You had uh, mm-hmm. all kinds of um, a master's degree and bachelor's degree. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what did made you decide to go the educational route in an in an institution like an educational institution shouldn't you say institution in terms of in terms of for my profession <laughs> yeah to come like, back well, I'm, and do that? I'm guessing like why did you decide well, to make that choice lots of reasons i really love the university of georgia i still uh, i think if you cut deep enough i bleed uh, red and black so uh, i really love the university of georgia i love my time in athens and so when an opportunity came up to work for the college uh, it just seemed like a natural fit for me. I didn't know anything about raising money for anything, much less for College of Agriculture. And uh, fortunately, no one else there did either, so that was okay. <laughs> um, I w- it was actually an experimental position that the university was doing. They had never mm. had a decentralized fundraising operation before. They um, uh, had a pilot with me and then a person for the law school there. And it was a three-year pilot um, and... The salary was shared between central development, the college, and then it more migrated to the college after the end of the third year. Well, in that time period, the vice president for development changed the university president, well, because the university president changed, and they decided oh, that decentralized model wasn't what they wanted to do after all, so my position essentially got eliminated as a you fundraiser. You ro- rolled into something else. So I rolled into another job because by then I was 100% on the dean's 
pay payroll. So he decided what to do with me, and that was ag alumni, and then later student recruitment. And then you wound up with the opportunity through Maury uh, coming to Purdue University, mm-hmm. where you then spent the next twenty eight plus twenty eight years. years. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, real high level, the types of involvement you had with Purdue. You worked working in the College of Ag. Mm-hmm. You were involved in government relations. You were involved in well, that ag came alumni. later. Okay. That came later. Uh, the The position I had for twenty eight years was the um, executive director of the Ag Alumni Association. Well, it started as executive secretary. That was the title Maury had, and then later it became executive director. But um, about um, seven years ago, maybe now, um, when I had been there a little over twenty years, I had a discussion with the dean that I wanted a new challenge. And where could I take my talent for relationship building? Because that's really what I consider myself as a relationship manager. Uh, I develop those relationships and then help to manage them for the college. And we didn't really have anybody doing federal relations um, at that time. So the dean saw that as a gap and felt that my talents would fit there. And I... Uh, it fit my interest for sure. I, I hope that my talents fit uh, what I, what they needed, but I, it certainly fit what I needed because I loved that part of my job. So I did that for the next seven years. And as you know, the group that you ha- have that you were volu- that are a volunteer for the uh, Purdue Council for Agricultural Research Extension and Teaching, P. Carrot, um, is a, a grassroots organization that's organized at the county, district, and state levels in Indiana. Uh, so that people advocate for us at the local, state, and federal levels um, to advocate. Because Purdue uh, Agriculture, uh, because of its land-grant mission, uh, land-grant universities are unique in that they have a tripartite mission. Most places, um, you know, say a liberal arts college will only have uh, an academic uh, instruction mission, teaching. Uh, then you have other places that have uh, a research component added into it. But land-grant universities are unique because they have the extension function as that third part of their mission, and that is to take the educational products that are developed at the university, that research, take that information and deliver it to people in packages that help them to have better lives and more productive livelihoods. Okay. Um so going back to the the first job that you had at Purdue mm-hmm. as, a, or I guess the second job as the executive director of the alumni association, mm-hmm. what, uh, what are the details of that job? What does that entail? Essentially, I was responsible for uh, developing a volunteer network for the College of Agriculture uh, among our alumni and friends. Um, and the alumni of the College of Agriculture are not just the four-year Uh, alumni, uh, because for many years, there was an eight-week winter short course at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that are our alumni are graduates or certificate holders from that winter short course. Now, that program ended in the early 90s, I believe it was. And, but the people who went back uh, with that certificate, went back to local communities, became a a large core group of supporters for our college, and we count them among our alumni body. So I went around, when I first took the job, there were over 40 county chapters of Purdue Ag alumni around the state, um, active chapters, and by active that meant they had had at least one meeting in the last year. And some of those folks had meetings two, three times a year. There was a very active group over here in uh, Henry County. Um, we had a very, uh, this uh, Newcastle was pro- usually where we held our district meeting for this district. Um, oh, cool. So, so do you remember some of the names that we would be involved with there? Oh, we'll put yeah. you on the spot. Oh, Donya. wow, wow. <laughs> it's been a long time since I have have been over here for uh, yeah. uh, for meetings. So there are a lot of the guys. Uh, Bob Bittler was one who was really important to us. Bob lived in the Knightstown area, and uh, Bob is is no longer with us but uh he we had a lot of summer meetings were held at bob's home and that was really really special so that's really Mm -hmm. neat well that's the thing i would imagine with the ag alumni association or with that group is Mm -hmm. you it's a very intimate group and you're 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 spending time on a lot of farms Mm -hmm. you're not well a lot of the meetings i end up with are in a government conference center or some oh yeah i had a a lot of tool shed meetings and so in in 1990 i had never worn a pair of pants to work 
Um, you got to remember, it's a whole different time. It's before you guys are born. And, uh, well, these so, two. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so it, was, it was really a different time. And I, I had never worn pants to work. I always wore skirts. And so finding things that I felt were appropriately professional but were also uh, – appropriate to wear to a tool shed meeting that was uh, kind of a challenge <laughs> thank god for lands in and washable cotton uh, cardigan and skirt sets uh, i wore lots of those in those days but yeah i, I had a lot of that face-to-face contact because i mean we didn't i was at purdue and we got our first email for crying out loud and uh, that's something none of y'all remember no wonder no wonder you got <laughs> done yet purdue at edu you bet. i was there yeah, yeah yeah well no i didn't have that in the beginning because we had a whole different uh, set of we had a whole different uh, server configuration so yeah, I've gone through several iterations of email, but uh, yeah, so so it was a lot of that face to face relationship building for the college and getting to know people, getting to know who had an interest in our college, who wanted to be promoters of us, who who really knew people in their communities and were interested in helping us recruit students. Uh, who were the influencers? I mean, it's the same thing you guys do with with political issues. Who are the influencers? Uh, so. Because our extension service, and back to that, the extension service is a partnership of local government because we have an office in all, or I still say we, Purdue has an office in all of Indiana's counties. And it's one of the few extension services in the country that does still have an office in all the counties. And the that, office, uh, the office for Henry County here is about a block away. Right. You parked in the lot you would park in to go to the, to go uh, Henry to the County extension, extension office. office. And so, so there, there is a front door to Purdue university in every County in this state. And the, so that is an arm of the college of agriculture, but that's a partnership because Henry County has a services contract with Purdue extension to provide a portion of the funding Likely as not, the clerical person that works in that office is paid by the county as a county staff member, um, and then there's a, a contract for services to provide those educators, however many there are in the county, that are employed by Purdue. Counties have a voice in who is hired. They participate in the hiring process. Uh, it's it's managed by Purdue, of course. Through an extension board. Right. A local Purdue extension and board. And so, so there, there is local uh, input into the hiring process for those people and local input then through those extension boards about the kind of programming that's appropriate for a community because it's very different what you need in Henry County versus what someone who is in a suburb of uh, uh, Gary might need yeah. or, or or Fort Wayne or, or down if around Louisville. If you're talking about an issue in Lake County, you're talking mm-hmm. you're a lot of times you're working with urban farming mm-hmm. and, and that's the natural resources side or you're working with STEM and four H, whereas over here you may be dealing with an issue in a pond or you might be mm-hmm. working with forestry or, or row crops. And and to go to the, the When Farms Are Cool t shirt and, and bring that into they look the discussion. really cool by the way. And bring <laughs> that into the discussion. <laughs> land use. Land use pl- and planning. Those are things that Purdue has experts in. And so people who can come in with information unbiased information, just information, so that then people can apply that information to their value system and make appropriate decisions for their communities, for their families, you know, whatever the issue is, whether it's how to manage finances, all of those kinds of things. Uh, but it's it's really great in, in services for, for farmers. And we talk about farming. My husband farms. And so when you look at farming, Everybody else that comes to our door has something to sell. The information they provide has a slant. The the people that my husband connects with at Purdue have unbiased information. They have information that he can trust. When he was when he looks to make decisions with inputs. I mean when margins are small, it's really important that you watch, you know, and don't just buy something because the salesman says it's good. Yeah, it's, com- right. company A is trying to sell company A's you, product. You betcha, you betcha. And and I don't blame them at all that they're doing their jobs. But as a farmer, as a citizen, I need something else. And where do I get that? Well, my land-grant university is a place I can get that. So, so that's the purpose and the role that it serves to be useful in our world and, and to help us to make better decisions uh, for our farm and, and for our family uh, and things that will help us to be more profitable. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I had no idea. Like whenever, so I guess the, I knew that someone was doing it, right? So mm-hmm. you know, but <laughs> you, you don't if you're not involved in that world, you don't really think right. about it, right? And and that's what Jeremiah's on that that grassroots group to talk and and to help people understand at the local level, and then and and decision makers. He goes as part of that group. He talks to local decision makers. We've had cases in counties who, you know, county budgets, I mean, everybody's stressed, uh, you know, as, as medical costs for county employees go up, all those kinds of things, where do we cut? What do we do? And our roads are in bad shape. Well, okay, this, this 4-H program, maybe we can cut that. Well, the people for whom that's important um, want to be heard at the right. county level. Yeah. And people like Jeremiah um, are, are there to help us communicate with those decision makers. And again, Provide them the information to show the difference this makes in your community and the payback that you're getting for the dollars that you invest. Because that's we like to talk in terms of investment, not expenditures. Because I said, well, again, I said we, uh, but I think that's going to stick with you for a long I time. I think <laughs> that's a hard habit to break. But but we talk about uh, investments uh, more more than we talk about expenditures because. When we look and when we talked to those decision makers, we talked about the return and we talked about leveraging, that the money that they put in from their piece was leveraged to help us get other monies. That if we have a scientist who's really good in their field to do research on ABC, that helps us attract private dollars for sponsored research. It helps us attract uh, all kinds of other funding from other agencies that may be looking to solve a problem. The Department of Defense, the National Institutes of Health, those kinds of things R- have... REMC just worked with Purdue mm-hmm. University and I think the College of Ag. I, I, I could be wrong on that, but on rural broadband. Oh, yes, 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 absolutely involved in that. Um, our, uh, our cooperative extension service and uh, I'm sure probably the Office of Engagement. I'm not quite sure um, uh, the folks that would all be involved in that, but but definitely our extension service has been very interested in that because rural broadband is is critical to providing opportunities for rural counties and for citizens to be on an equal footing economically. We have so, gigabit internet service in this studio in rural Henry County, Indiana. Wow. One uh, gigabyte up and 250 down. Which allows wow. us which to put out a, pro- a broadcast across right. the world in right. incredible quality. Right. Um, you know. It, but you're, how, a rare, you're a rare bird. We are, yeah. There, it, there, it's not... It's definitely not available in all 92 counties. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, a lot of people don't understand the gem that we have whenever it comes to having the, the internet speeds and the quality that we, well, that we have here. And, and just what is expected, I, I have a, a young friend is in her first year of teaching at middle school there in the North Montgomery system. And her husband was telling us the other night that her, she had assigned homework or whatever and Kids came back, and there were kids that couldn't do their homework because they don't have internet at home. I mean, Mm -hmm. and and it's not just affordability. Uh, For some families, it's the affordability issue, but it doesn't matter how much money you have in some parts of our county. There is no reliable internet service for those folks. Nothing that can compare to areas like where we have our fiber available right. to us. Right. So before we move on mm-hmm. to our next topic, I want to ask you in your professional and uh, very former, pr- former profession yes, <laughs> and, and unbiased opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't do, do you that. think <laughs> everybody has a bias? <laughs> would, would do you say that serving on the uh, serving with pea carrot would uh, lend itself very well to someone who uh, would be on the county council in an area? Wink. <laughs> well, I think that, that serving on PCARIT provides a window to a lot of what uh, is available. Just like you've been sitting here with your eyes being open to some things that the Land Grant University provides. I think that Jeremiah has learned a lot through PCARIT about what Purdue is and specifically what Purdue agriculture can do for communities. And so in terms of linkages and partnerships, I think anybody who understands who the players are is in a better position to to overlay that to problems they encounter in their work or their, their public service, whatever it is. 
if I mean, the bigger our networks are and the more understanding we have, the more information that we can assimilate to problems and help to solve problems more effectively. Something Purdue, Wonderful answer. Something Purdue is involved mm -hmm. in that a lot of people don't realize in the College of Ag is, mm -hmm. is they are on the front lines of trying to get out in front of the opioid epidemic. I, a friend of ours today right. said he's attended more funerals for people his age oh. than he has weddings. Oh, my. Uh, which oh, is, is horrible. Which stuck me right through the heart when I, when I read that, but he's probably wow. right. Wow. Uh, because millennials get married later, and we're losing... We're losing people way, way too early. I, I yeah. know. Um, Just open a newspaper uh, yeah. and, and look at the ages. Um, uh, and it, it's a real problem. Uh, so mm -hmm. what Purdue Extension has done at a mm -hmm. pilot level, and it's beginning to right. uh, go through. Henry County sent their their, edu their health and human services agent through training uh, health and recently. Human sciences. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's alphabet soup at the university <laughs> level. Um <laughs> Yes, sciences. Health and human sciences. Uh, it's not the uh, mm -hmm. the cabinet level position. It's, there you it, go. Yes, there that, you that's go. the uh, mm -hmm. the other side. But we, we our our agent, mm -hmm. our educator, mm -hmm. uh, went through that program, mm -hmm. and that is designed to get people before they get involved. And it's a it's a very it's a preventative program. Well, and, and there are lots of things that uh, the extension service is doing in terms of of building healthier families. Because, you know, trying to intervene at family levels, why is it that people get addicted in the first place? And what is it? Is it, is it a breakdown of family structure? What, what is it that goes on? Can we intervene sooner? Because we know that if we can spend dollars to keep people from being addicted, it will be cheaper in the long run for everybody. Than Save a lot of money on treatment and rehabilitation You bet. Centers. You bet. I mean, if you just look at it from a dollars and cents perspective, it's, smart, it's a smarter expenditure of money to prevent an addiction than it is to treat one. Um, or to lock somebody up. Yeah, well, which is what we end up exactly, doing. Exactly, exactly. And and so so from a from a, an expenditure standpoint, and counties are stretched. I mean, whatever we can do to help our budgets is smart. But that aside, then the human cost. I mean, right. The, and and we and we just shared an article on our page uh, today or yesterday about how Indiana is receiving uh, twenty five million dollars from the federal government to help fight the opioid epidemic and it's part of this uh part of this grant process that the trump administration has is sending out a billion dollars all across the nation so wow. it's not it's it's, it's not everywhere. just yeah it's not just here and the sad thing about it is that that 25 million dollars that we're getting is going to scratch the tip of the iceberg yeah, of yeah. the problem yeah. right yeah so it's uh, it's it's an incredible problem and and that's why we talk about these things like extension that's all we already have an infrastructure i mean everybody talks about infrastructure and how important it is well we have this delivery infrastructure in place through the cooperative extension service that's in every community people who know they they know the community they know the influencers in the community they know the problems of a community firsthand and so they know what they need to do so they can come to people who have the funding and say here's what we need for henry county and lake county can do the same thing in extension in ways that other entities can't always do but then they're partners because they're part of that county system they're already partners with county health departments with with others in the county that are looking at these same things in and our county the health department mm -hmm. is on the second floor of a building and the extension office is on the third floor right they share a bathroom well so they're working they're, you know, they're it, working with they're, each other every day they they're know integrated. each other yeah. and and that's what i'm saying when you have people who are already working in the community and they're looking to solve community problems that's the people we should go to first. And the fact that they're also tied to a world-class university that is developing information to help us understand problems and social science problems as well as scientific ones, um, that's all the better. All right. Well, we will leave the extension side there mm -hmm. for now, unless Chase has any more questions. Yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. And, and we'll talk. I did bring you in with the shirt. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. I'll give you a shout out. <laughs> we, won't show, we won't show Donya the back of the when shirt until it's cool. over. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't want her. All I want to say. Yeah, she, I don't want her to read. Make the back sure that whenever you yeah, I don't walk, want you to read the back. Whenever you walk out the walk out the I'll door, just walk he... with your back out. <laughs> I'll go sideways. Because <laughs> I think I think Donya considers herself to be a baby boomer, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you have to be careful. 
Anyway, so, didn't expect that. So you, don't look like, you don't look like a baby boomer. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Chase is the charmer of the no, table. Asking for forgiveness nice. already. Always. There you go. I use a good moisturizer. <laughs> so, at a larger level, uh, in, working with agriculture and, and with a, a university, we would as libertarians say, hey, we want to be completely devoid of government and live in a vacuum where it doesn't exist and everybody makes their own decisions and we voluntarily associate and do things. That's our utopia that That's, exists only in those video yeah, games that, I was that, talking that, about. That earlier. doesn't exist in the real world that we're <laughs> right. in. Right. So we, we we live in the world of the possible, and that's why I'm involved with P-Carrot, so that mm-hmm. I can be involved in the conversation and understand and get mm-hmm. you know and, and educate myself mm-hmm. uh, because we don't just get to live on voluntary island. Right. Um, what... Is there any level of a university that is not tied to government? I, I, you're at a state college, so it, a portion of tuition is paid by the state of Indiana. Um, it, 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 no. Or, well, not, Tui- it's a state-funded school. Yeah, tuition the tuition dollars. doesn't, but there are other facets of the university that are, right. that are carried by the school, by the state, rather. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess what I'm saying is there, there, there's not an easy way to get to a, a totally private education system. You're going to have public universities. We'll, I it, hope. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> I hope. Um, when you have public universities, then you're going to be having interactions with government. So mm-hmm. then you end up with people that have, fed, I assume you have, I know you have state level people because I've met them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have people that are interacting with the, the legislature, which is setting a set of funding for mm-hmm. the university. Right. Uh, and then doing it at the federal level as well. Right. So just some insight into what kind of things that they, those people get involved in and what they're, you know, they're setting priorities for the university and then explaining that to the people that write the budgets for the schools. Sure. Um, in terms of, of the, the in, really uh, the state, and with uh, state and federal, the College of Agriculture is the one that is most tied to government because of the federal piece of legislation, uh, two federal pieces of legislation that fund us, um, the, the Smith-Lever Act, which funds the Extension Service, and the Hatch Act, which funds the research uh, component. So we are more closely tied than any other college at Purdue to, to the federal government. To the federal government. Now, there's a caveat with those federal pieces. They must be matched by state dollars. So that automatically ties us then to the state government. There must be at least a one-to-one match. In Indiana, we get more than that. So so there's an automatic tie for the College of Agriculture that simply does not exist for liberal arts, for the College of Science, engineering, all those other pieces. So, So we have people that understand all of those things and just by nature of that world, our faculty are much more savvy many times about those relationships because they, they're familiar with them. They work with them. So, so that's really the history of government relations at Purdue really has its roots in the College of Agriculture for that reason. Um, uh, John Hicks, who I think was probably the first um, I don't know if John originally was the vice president. I think he was an assistant to the president. And then John was actually acting president at one time. But he was a professor of agricultural economics. And he understood um, he understood government expenditures, but he also understood the pieces that helped to fund the university. So John went there. John Huey after him, same thing, professor of agricultural economics. And then later, uh, Terry Stree, who had been the director of ag services and regulation, really in charge of our state level uh, advocacy in the College of Agriculture. Terry Stree moved over, worked with John Huey, and later became the vice president uh, for government relations for Purdue. So, so that's really the first history of government relations at Purdue came from our college because of that, because of that close relationship. But so the things, though, that we would look at, I mean, there are, like everything else, there are regulations that come down the pike that affect the university. Um, We had a coal plant. So regulations, at one point, I remember being on a conference call with federal relations uh, from Purdue, and um, we had somebody whose job was to worry about those regulations that impacted the universities because this coal plant thing. A university is is basically its own city. It's a little city. We've got a police department. We've got a fire department, um, you know, all of that, a power plant, everything. And so, so when that came into, into being, um, you know, 
there are people that have to pay attention to that at the federal level as well as at the state level. And then at the state level, you know there are some functions at, um, at, in Indiana that are very unique uh, to the College of Agriculture and, and to Purdue. And uh, for because for many years, Indiana did not have a Department of Agriculture. Uh, when Mitch Daniels was governor, he implemented a Department of Agriculture, instituted that for the first time. Prior to that, uh, a lot in most states, let's back up, most states, those the regulatory functions that are, you know, for feed, seed, fertilizer, uh, pesticides, all those things. They belong to the land-grant university. In Indiana. Okay. Most hmm. states, they belong to a Department of Agriculture that is political. It's ah. an elected uh, Secretary of Agriculture that controls that. Hmm. In Indiana, all of those regulatory functions are under the office of the Indiana State Chemist. And by law, the Indiana State Chemist must be a tenured professor of biochemistry at Purdue University. And really? so all of those departments, the feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticide regulation, is all underneath the office of the Indiana State Chemist. And that is at Purdue. And so those are fee-based services. So people who own seed companies have to pay uh, you know, their seed has to be properly labeled, all of this kind of thing. We have inspectors that do that. But any of those services for inspection or whatever, those things are, are fee-based. And so those fees are approved at the state. And so that's one of the things that the director of Ag Services and Regulations uh, works with because he, uh, that person acts as the dean of agriculture's liaison for those functions. The other piece of that um, uh, regulatory piece lies in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and that's the Animal Disease and Diagnostic Laboratory, which is obviously very important in terms of monitoring and uh, helping to educate people about animal diseases And because some animal diseases can be passed to people. Others have impact on food safety. Yeah, we, could lose, we could lose a huge food. If we had something happen in a hog operation, all, all of a sudden kinds of things. We the, can world, lose. the world food supply is in danger. All kinds of bad stuff. And just happen. listening to you talk earlier, mm -hmm. you said that you thought about starting a podcast, and you mm -hmm. ought to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I told you, Danya's. Uh, I've learned Danya's so much already. Well, yeah. good. We're I'm only glad. 45 my, minutes I, in. My mission is complete. Poor Danya. I, I listened. Mm -hmm. I asked a question about hemp seed to John Baugh, the, uh -huh. the state fellow. Direct, at, the director the, of Ag Services and Regulation at Purdue. Who, mm -hmm. who works with the state level. Right, but, right. And we were having a legislative conversation, mm -hmm. and I said, well, what about hemp in Indiana? And poor John, it was a twenty-minute spiral down, and it, it came back to the feed, <laughs> it came back to the the seed commissioner. Mm -hmm. And it, right. It, right now, there's right. A, the, the way the state has things set up. There's a bottleneck that comes back to the seed commissioner, and they're worried because there's federal regulation. If they would get out of the way, then you could that product could exist legally in Indiana, and well, the state could approve it. Yeah, because Steve, that that's the other the other thing is because we get federal funding, we can't be in violation of any federal laws. And so uh, I don't understand all the ins and outs, but but the hemp industry and it, there's a there's a real issue there um, that yeah. we have to be if, concerned if, if about. There's, if there's some federal clarification and that mm -hmm. that gets dealt with, we could catch right. up with Kentucky. Exactly, and then Henry exactly. Henry County and Indiana's farmers could could potentially start to yeah, and in see, that and and where project. where those those um, that is that's the one thing uh, in my twenty eight years of living in Indiana that I've ever known about where uh, having the regulatory function at Purdue at the land grant university hindered an industry rather than helped it. In most cases, having it apolitical is a very good thing. Yeah, right. um, where Kentucky has an elected it's, agriculture. Uh, it's it's, it's in their Department of Ag, yep. and so the government, uh, the governor down there, can figure out if they want to do this, and they're not at risk of losing federal dollars for uh, a university. But it would be crushing Man, to if, a university if oh, that happened, because you've got we could you, yeah you we just can't. I mean, or yeah. they it's, can't. it's too they much can't. of a risk. If, they can't. If just you mm -hmm. asking the question took mm -hmm. twenty minutes, imagine how long the <laughs> legislative process is going to take. Yeah. Notice I said is going to take. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, oh, it will be dealt with. It, <laughs> yeah. will, it will be dealt with because yeah. I was just reading uh, uh, the the CBD business now is a billion dollar business. They sell um, it at our barbershop now. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's everywhere. And, uh, you know, I mean, I have 
you know, friends who swear by it in terms of, you know, topical creams and all those kinds of things, yeah, but, but it's huge. We posted another article on our page uh, today that was talking about CBD oil and how there's still a negative stigma attached to it because it's derived from marijuana or hemp, and people think... Un, people but it has, aren't educated about it, don't think that and they think yeah. that it gets you high it has none think, of the thc i, I think in the last <laughs> i think in the last 12 to 24 months most people have gotten to understand that yeah where you can go talk to the average this was the, the average person and they're it, actually gonna understand that they that. understand the difference between between cbd oil, CBD oil and oil. cannabis or yeah. cbd oil and right and and, and thc and and the derivation of it that, yes. that it, it's it's the the non-intoxicant yes uh, yeah yeah Mm, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, so, and I, so I think the that, governor himself last week said he's he's ready to start considering medicinal marijuana. So he I, did on uh, the Hammer and Nigel show. We're coming. Bring us close. the weed. <laughs> <laughs> I have back wind pain. farms. <laughs> we're we're coming closer and CBD, closer man. and closer to some of you these becoming marketable the products. Right, <laughs> that's right. pretty nice. Which is going to help Indiana well, farmers. Exactly. I mean, I mean, agriculture diversification of crop uh, production is is. Very good yeah, for agriculture. Not a bad the, thing. Oh, always it's good. I mean, we've we've looked at, at our farm uh, over the years. We've looked at opportunities, and some of them haven't come through. We've grown specialty crops just in in corn and soybeans thus far, but we did come very close one time to getting a green bean contract uh, with a company out of Canada. And uh, but but anything a farmer can do to diversify themselves is insulation against um, you know a bad economic situation or bad weather situation i mean anything you can do to diversify crops is good one of our co-hosts is cade coger he's his family is at least a fourth generation farm if not fake farmer (laughs) he's a fake farmer uh the cogers inside joke it's yeah he's he got called a fake farmer on one of our facebook live streams one time because he was his family was in favor of wind turbines and they, oh no, he well, got called a fake farmer because he because can go. On, no. He can go on vacation and he can afford a motorcycle. He's, and he's that's a fake not farmer how, because he yeah. has he doesn't have an old Massey Ferguson. He has modern farming equipment. <laughs> yeah. and it's not he like he has a his, tractor with a cab. Yeah, it's not like his grandfather had. Yeah, oh that's, my. that's well, why we're, he's a fake well, farmer. we're fake farmers too. Then, yeah, so. of course you are. Of course we are. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you're proud and proud of it. By the way, you're also probably doing four times the volume with half the manpower that they were forty years ago. We we farm the farms of I think six families. Yeah. Husband does, and, and he. Wow. By the way, he does it with uh, with one permanent, one full time person. Yeah, but he's he doesn't have the uh, mm-hmm. he doesn't have mobility like some do. That's correct. My husband's in a wheelchair. He's yeah. a paraplegic, so he mm. farms the farms of six families with one hired person. And, I mean, obviously, we have other people during uh, busy times, but right, temporary seasonal help, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, the uh, yeah, Kate, Cade's family they've diversified as we're talking about, where they have they they have a. a a row crop operation like okay. many do. They have a produce farm stand mm-hmm. and they have a, uh, a, a a beef cattle operation. Mm-hmm. So they do all three of those and, you know, and that, then when one doesn't do as well, they've got other options. Uh, well, you, you talked about the regulation side and mm-hmm. Dakota had in our show notes uh, who regulates agriculture and, and he mentioned the USDA, oh, wow. the EPA, and FDA. Those are the big three that, that I thought of, that and, I could think of. Um, and... Well, I guess uh, my my biggest question was there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of attempted cent- central planning that goes on in the world of agriculture right. that I have uh, learned recently mm-hmm. and it's uh, basically um, different agencies trying to decide okay this is where uh, we need this many crops going here and like just like how the uh, the governor just met with um, uh, some governor type person in Canada Winnipeg. the past yes mm-hmm. and they were talking about how the the trade between there and Indiana has grown by 36% since 2013 okay. so there's a lot of a, attempted central planning that goes into into agriculture am i wrong or and i would call that central planning um hey. i i would call that uh, growing markets. I mean, what what they were actually doing was was trying to develop market opportunities for Indiana products, and so that's a lot of the relationship building that goes on. I I don't think there is the the central planning. If it happens, it happens through um, influencing behavior of producers. 
through uh, primarily through conservation programs, uh, those kinds of things where um, marginal lands uh, over time, there have been a number of conservation programs that have uh, uh, paid incentives for people to take marginal land out of production and conserve it and send in it back some to way, forest or, or grasslands yeah. or whatever. Um, is that how we got the buffalo up in northwestern Indiana? I don't know. I don't know about that. But uh, the the other thing that we've done is is it try to influence behavior in terms of water quality, um, uh, in terms of of conservation programs where we have um, uh, counties, uh, 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 county soil and water conservation districts uh, participating and helping farmers to develop uh, grass waterways and adopt conservation farming practices, those <laughs> kinds of things. So, so influencing behavior is okay. what I would and say. And whenever they're trying to... It did go terribly wrong. You maybe grab me something. Yeah. yeah, if you want to give me a paper towel from the other room. I opened a Guinness and it went... It got exciting. It is everywhere. His, really his shorts are soaked That's now. That's really ugly. Oh, no. Sarah has... Uh, Sarah's not going to let me in the door. So whenever I'm you say... I'm going to my own laundry. Yeah. Whenever you say that they're incentivized or they're influencing behavior, uh, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that they're uh, applying some sort of an incentive for the farmers right, to that, to follow what, the, what they perceive is the best protocol or the safest protocol, right? So how would they, how would you, how do they incentivize the farmers to well, do that? It, for instance, there there might be a conservation reserve program that would incentivize if if you've got X number of acres that are less productive and you will take those out of production. At times in our history, uh, we've had government to say, we have these huge crop surpluses, so okay. how do we reduce that? And can we do that in a way that's helpful in other ways? And so providing uh, conservation lands... Um, would be a thing that is environmentally helpful. That's where in the 1980s you had programs where people were paid, paid to paid, not. That's where you hear about yeah, people being paid, paid not, not to, to farm. farm. That doesn't really happen now, uh, to my yeah. knowledge. Um, we have uh, situations where we can't participate in government programs uh, that are the, the safety net programs. If we don't do things according to some prescribed um, measures, like if we if we farmed in a very irresponsible way, we could lose our opportunity. I don't know all the details of that, so this I've, I've already gone I, past what I know. There's probably nobody that knows all the details of all of these things because yeah. it's, it's somewhat complicated. Yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, very quite complicated. A, quite a bit, but, as we're learning. Yeah, but that's but that's how farming would be. That's one instance. Now, farmers who produce uh, food for consumption, there's a lot more things going on because we've had a lot of situations. For instance, you're no doubt familiar with the the melon uh, situation in in southwest Indiana a few years ago when we had, um, there was a contamination issue with a processing uh, an on-farm processing situation. And so that's that's where you get uh, a lot of things that have come out in terms of regulating farms and how they handle foods. I think that's probably a good thing because I don't think that um, everybody knows necessarily the safest way to do things. I think that we have to teach people. That's where the education side of Purdue exactly. comes in, where you, you think, the the view is, I'm going to well, say you think, the view is that having an extension program well, in the county that you're on a first-name basis with, when it's when we decide, hey, the way the proper way to grow and process and handle lettuce so that we don't have a outbreak yeah, of yeah, whatever. What's the, what's the best way? And especially, like, if I'm a new grower, okay, how do I do this? How do I set this up? What are What are the best practices? What are yeah. the, what are the okay. best practices? And so when this melon scare happened, one of the things I actually knew the woman who who did this research, she went down. She called me and asked me who is the who's a melon person I can talk to. Well, we had a person who had been on the dean's advisory committee. I put her in contact with them because she had a um, I think it was a BSL three lab a greenhouse uh, whatever the highest level of of contaminant. Uh, uh, 
confinement is in terms of safety. So she could actually use some of those. Uh, she was a control environment. Yeah, basically. she could have huh. she could have a, a in her greenhouse. She could infect plants with these things and keep them confined. And so and she, see how they but were. she wanted to huh. do that in a way that mimicked how these plants would actually be produced so that her research would be valid. And so she worked with the producers to say, help me design my program here. But she was working with some sponsored research with Dole and some others to help develop some novel sanitizing methods for um, uh, produce because she actually found in her research that um, I think I think it was E. coli that she infected seed with. Hmm. And she infected the melon seed. No, with? no, tomato seeds in okay. this particular case. And but still, tomato seeds she, with E. coli. Yeah, she she and through through wash water. Think about how tomato seeds uh-huh. are. And so for yeah. seed production, you would wash off flesh off of the seeds to produce them to sell to you know. John and Jane Gardner to plant in their backyards. Shout out to John and Jane Gardner. Yeah. If, if that... Probably of nice down Indiana. Yeah. If that um, wash water is infected with E. coli, the seed industry had always said they couldn't be a source of contamination for these, uh, for these uh, food pathogens. She showed that if you used infected wash water, up to 30% of the tomatoes would be infected internally. What? That's crazy. Wash it all you want to. It ain't coming out. That's nuts. From the seeds? Yep. How, how does it survive that long? From the seed to germination Dude, to Dude, I'm just harvest? telling you the research. I don't know that. <laughs> oh, it's just crazy. I need uh, to... Up to I 30% want to know more. of the fruit could be infected internally. And she actually had to develop some really novel ways to slice into that fruit because... Think about if you slice into the fruit, that knife can infect, Anything. you know, uh, can, yeah. can take a pathogen Unless into the flesh. purely sanitized, you're doing it in a but, vacuum chamber. But she, she actually had to, to develop some ways to, to stabilize that tissue, to freeze it, and do some other things, I think, that uh, ensured she was not... She um, wasn't going to contaminate it. She when wasn't she cut contaminating it, and she wasn't her going sample, to be picking up what, whatever was or on something the knife. else. She wasn't going to be contaminating it. That she was actually getting valid research, but she showed up to to thirty uh, percent of the fruit. Wow, that's infected. crazy. Yeah, that is, that I'm never eating totally fruit again. <laughs> <laughs> well, she she does a program. She she did for some P carrot groups. Actually, I, I took her to uh, to do some programs, and she did one. Uh, it was called "What Evil Lurks in the Hearts of Romaine." And <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I've heard that lettuce can be pretty bad. Uh, uh, lettuce and spinach are the yeah. two that you seem. Uh, or it's arbitrary mm-hmm. from right. my end, but Which sucks. Th- I those love are two that you and see. But that's the ones that seem to all be the time that cause very a often. lot of the food safety issues in the country. It's not uncommon to but, go to a restaurant. Oh, I'm sorry, so, we're all out of lettuce right now. Well, let's circle circle back to federal monies and why it's important. Then see that all of us care that our food supply be safe, and so while your Utopia Island. Everybody's, you know, making their own free will choices. Just because somebody's a nice person and they've got a great smile doesn't mean that they're producing the safest food for my baby. And we don't necessarily have, at this point, we don't have traceability into, I know that 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 crop was raised at a facility in California and I can trace back to the farmer and know who did it. We don't necessarily have that visibility. So it's not, you don't have the brand awareness or ability there's, to know that there's this, a lot more of that than you think Well, from the consumer level. Mm. As a consumer, I can make right. a decision and say, Hey, I know that this is Guinness drought that I'm drinking right. and I know I trust the Guinness brand. Right. You don't necessarily have name brand manufacturers for on, on consumer labeling. Right. For lettuce. Right. Or right. spinach. You're right. buying the spinach that's sold right. at Kroger or Aldi or well, Marsh and, or wherever. Yeah, but if spinach starts hospitalizing people and they start getting sick and then all of a sudden all the media is going to pick it up. But our, our, this what spinach I'm saying is, is our, making people sick and our model you're not going to buy any spinach anymore. Our model knows that there's a problem with, if there's a problem with Diet Dr. Pepper, people say, well, don't buy Diet Dr. Pepper. Right. It could 
cripple an entire industry when it happens with spinach. Exactly. You yeah. don't have the brand because awareness. Because everybody stops buying all spinach. Exactly. Not just the spinach that came from Yuma, Arizona. It, exactly. That's and that's what I'm trying to say yeah. is you spinach don't have sucks anyways. It's difficult for markets. <laughs> Take that back. How dare you? In the libertarian world, markets decide, hey, there's a problem with, with Aquafina water. We're not going to buy Aquafina water. Right. Well, you don't have that ability with, with, with tomatoes. Pro, with produce. Yeah. Yeah, produce. I'm going to have to wait and listen spring. to what Steve Horwitz says about this. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Horwitz is an economist of all state yeah. uh, who we've uh, had on the show a mm-hmm. number of times. Um, all right. Anything else on the on the ag side, Dakota, that you want to cover that, that's high level we haven't gotten to? Because we're right at 60-minute mark, and we want to cover a couple of these local issues. Yeah. Because um, I... I I feel like uh, I not feel really. Like I'm, I'm pretty have. sure that she did. I, I basically I had a I had a whole list that you'll see on your show notes of things that I wanted to talk about, and you have, without me even asking, you've touched on them. It's like you were the most well prepared guest ever. <laughs> I'm a savant when it comes to talking about the land grant university. Yeah, no, you, I, should, I am you really an, should start that podcast. I I'm am an apostle. You. I I I think uh, uh, I think that. Um, uh, the land grant universities were the single best idea that our government's ever brought forth because it, it made education egalitarian. And they go back to the 1860s? Yes, that's correct. I remember I was in the Latta games. Do you remember Latta? Oh, my gosh. I yeah. I was in charge of Latta games when I first started at Purdue. Yeah. Probably mm-hmm. 19, let's say 96, 97. That's Henry a, County had a, a Latta probably group. probably about the last time we I did Latta games. I was probably at the tail end of Latta. Uh-huh. And I don't think we even competed. We just spent a lot of time at the office building here. Preparing. All of those question banks they were, were in my office. You bet. Man. You bet. Uh, I could still tell you that Thomas Jefferson invented the wooden mold board plow uh, or whatever <laughs> year that was. We spent a lot of time practicing. Dakota. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, so, yeah. We, and we learned a lot about but, that. But the land, land, the land grant long. universities, uh, a friend of mine said it so eloquently one time. He said the land grant universities were brought to bring education to the sons and daughters of the toilers, those who worked. Because prior to the land grant system, Education was the purview of the wealthy, and it, it was the patrician class that educated their children. The working class people did not educate their children. They couldn't afford to. There was no place for them to go, and the land-grant system changed that forever, and it changed my life forever. And uh, as I tell people, I, you know, I was a first-generation college graduate, and when you change some, when someone goes to college and they're the first one in their family, it doesn't just change their life, it changes their family. Change because the family tree. You change the family entirely because from that point on, everybody has a different aspirational level. My, um, my sister and I are the first two in our mm-hmm. family to uh, to get our bachelor's degrees. And it changes everything for the whole family. Uh, so so I just, I can't say enough good things about the fact that so we have this with opportunity. So that being said, I'm going to put you on mm-hmm. the spot, is it, is higher education a right? Do you think it should be a right? Because we know it's not a right because it's not in the Constitution. But do you think that it should be? I am I lean to the libertarian in terms of making things rights. Yeah. I, I think that that's the very strong way to put that. I think access to education is important and i think that's it's an it should be a, it should be a societal aspiration okay. i think not a right but a societal aspiration but we've come a long way to, to make education it, widely available, available. Got, yes, yeah. I agree we have yeah we have constitutionally guaranteed public education in the state of indiana mm-hmm. yep ivy tech is very 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 affordable at the community college level mm-hmm. for your first two years mm-hmm. purdue university is a public school that has held tuition firm for five years, five, six years, six, somewhere in that range. I think it's six now. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that there's another place where you can make education more affordable without making right. it free than the state of Indiana and the work right. that's been done here, which Mitch Daniels has been a big part of that and in the time the, he's been at school. And at the quality that it is. It's yes. not just education. It is a high-quality education. I don't know that I would want anybody having truly free education because you don't have skin in the game. But Amen. I think it's achievable right now with the system that we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Purdue has made great. One of the reasons that, that people have been battling student loan debts and, and mm-hmm. the libertarians talk about this issue uh, with student loans is we we give anybody money at any level to continue to accumulate student loans, which then drives your tuition prices. You're up, guaranteed which then causes a student loan. This out of control student debt where people leave with 
hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand well, dollars, or more student, student loan loans debt. were the only loans that were ever granted without any look at repayment capacity. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so that just, I mean, it it did it didn't matter at all. And so this this um, back a boiler plan that President Daniels has put in place, where people you, can you invest in a future you boiler, invest maker. in a student, and you're paid back a percentage of that student's earnings. Uh, I didn't know their, about that. Their That's future earnings. Yeah. So it's it's a program that uh, that President Daniels and actually he had to get some special things cleared at federal levels. Yeah, to, I would imagine to make that possible because we do receive federal dollars. You know, we are a granting agency for the federal loan and grant programs. So he had to to work with the, the federal government. Another way he had to work with them to be sure that, that this would not put Purdue in violation of some things and lose some other important funds. But it's a really important way to to make people look at the opportunities that your education is going to provide for you, that you don't just keep amassing debt in the name of getting a degree. We have, correct. unfortunately, we have a system that's set up where you'll go to school to become a public teacher, a public school mm-hmm. teacher, and in Indiana you get hired in and you're making between thirty and $35,000 a year as a public school teacher. And, and then, it, it's just, and then you realize, oh my gosh, oh yeah. I, this this isn't going to cut this. You know, this isn't so enough money over, to pay the bills I have, and I'm never going to get out of this hole. And over fifty percent of them in the first five years decide that that's not the career for them. That's why my my sister is going to school to be a a teacher, <laughs> uh-huh. and she has got a scholarship from the state of Indiana that mm-hmm. is practically full ride. Well, and the stipulation of that, knowing the five year uh, statistic was you have to teach in the state of Indiana for five years. Okay. Otherwise, you have to pay us back. Right. So right. It was a, I, I, that was something that I learned. And mm-hmm. it was, uh, that's kind of uh, says something about not only not only higher education, but the in education system in its entirety. So, like, we have, uh, I put down little snippets about the Department of Education here. It was established in 1979, and everybody wants to talk a bunch of crap about Betsy DeVoe, who is uh, President Trump's um, education yeah, secretary? Education mm-hmm. secretary appointee, and she brought a lot of attention to the Department of Education. And I thought, sitting out here as a uh, libertarian outsider without any skin in the game, which is the nice thing about being a libertarian. Dakota's because, a trade school guy. Yeah, <laughs> you're, I am. I, di- I didn't go to college. I went to. I I joined a construction union instead, mm-hmm. and they paid for my college. Right. And I learned to trade instead, and it has worked out fantastically for myself. But on the flip side, Betsy DeVoe brought a lot of attention to the Department of Education, and a lot of people didn't know anything about the Department of Education, knowing that it was only set up, you know, in 1979. What do they do? And that was one of my biggest questions. And having you in here answering a lot of those questions, some of the some of their functions are aren't evil government functions, right? Well, I haven't talked <laughs> anything about the Department of Education. No, this must be we, the Department yeah. of Agriculture. Every, everything well, we I've talked, talked a little about bit. Was, uh, was really based in, in the Department of Agriculture and uh, and through the but funding we, that comes through them. But we talked about needing about federally funded schools mm-hmm. and the thing. So I guess that's what yeah, I was talking okay, about. Yeah, not, but, not talking term, about the Department yeah, of Education necessarily. Yeah, in terms of the Department necessarily. of Education and its mission, I really haven't addressed that at all because I'm no. not familiar with that. In the least. That's not, yeah, that's not mm-hmm. the Purdue University. Your model is through the USDA. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, right. something that Danya is actually going to care about, I think. <laughs> uh, I, I think she's going to have an opinion. because I of, have an opinion about everything. Because, yeah, there we go. <laughs> you know that. uh, that's why you had me here. Everybody does. <laughs> everybody does. My, my, I live on the south side of Newcastle. And INDOT and the city of Newcastle partnered together. And they, they are... We had a, a student that lost his, their life about 10 years ago in front of an elementary school because there weren't walking paths at Westwood Elementary. I want to say that's the timeline. I, I could be yeah, a little hazy on that, but it's probably to eight, five to 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Riley Elementary is another one, and it's in a, uh, a neighborhood. Uh, it's the elementary school that my future children uh, theoretically would go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, should I? Do, be, you, do you, know, you want to make should, an announcement? I have no announcement <laughs> to make at this time. But in, in theory, that would be the, that's, that would be the school. Uh, so my house is about a half mile south of these. Uh, so there are some sidewalks that were built uh, on on Riley Road, which is our east-west street, and then Main Street, which is about a mile. We'll say it's a mile 
uh, to the west of State Road 3, which is our main boulevard. State Road 3 is like a five lane wide, you know, all it's like uh, it's a busy, it's a busy, busy thoroughfare. And then Main Street is it's like a secondary road. Main Street goes through downtown, but it's a secondary street. Most people don't realize it's Main Street. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There are like there are like I didn't until tonight and I've been to Newcastle many times. Exactly. Uh, So Main Street has sidewalks now from from Riley Road to the south to pretty much the end of the city. Close. Comes with about 800 feet of where my neighborhood starts. So there's a little bit of distance, but I am a total beneficiary of these things being built. So I'm pretty happy about it as a guy that lives down there. Uh, but the complaining on the internet, Chase, yeah, has been Jer, unbelievable. I, I've seen a picture of the walkway. Was that your dog? It was my dog, yes. It's gotten a lot bigger than the last time I saw it. <laughs> anyways. Because he didn't come to the party. Yeah, if, if he'd show I up was once in a while, Chicago. Chase, okay. I want to talk about that after a little while. Your but Chicago's anyways, back. I saw the picture of the sidewalk. I think it looks great. I don't know why people are complaining. So we have a sidewalk that was built that is not concrete. Okay. Yes. It's asphalt. Uh, it's not done yet. What's there the difference, still, Chair? Uh, asphalt is made from rock and oil. Concrete is made from, from cement, cement. Okay. or cement yes. and aggregates. So All they're right. different. One is an oil-based product. Cement and the other one's the not. aggregates together. for saying concrete One is black, one is gray. <laughs> so as a general rule, most people expect sidewalks to be concrete. Uh the city found out that uh, INDOT, in an effort to actually make this project happen with the money they had, they went and looked at an alternate. They trimmed out some of the distance that doesn't take it all the way to my neighborhood. They made a change, and now it's an asphalt sidewalk. Because or walking it, path. It, it, it did come from a grant from the state of Indiana that was a, I think it's titled like Safe Way to School. Safe grant. Walkways to School, which is yeah. the, because we had this, this fatality about 10 years mm-hmm. ago. The, the city looked into it, I, I assume. So they're like, whoa, and found, this is a busy funding. road because, I mean, I, I'm one of the people that takes that road to work every morning. So it's like, this is a busy uh, intersection and a very busy walkway for students that are trying to get to the, the education. Or education. Get to their school. They're trying to get to their school. And, and you have- riding their bikes, walking. And one of the biggest complaints that I saw was, was – Sidewalks are concrete. <laughs> walkways are asphalt. You told us we were getting a sidewalk, not a walkway. I thought that was pretty funny. I'm just saying. Now, there, there was nothing here before, Danya. <laughs> it looks easier to ride your bike on, to skateboard on. I like it. Or to as walk a, your as dog. a homeowner or to that walk would be, your dog. As a homeowner that has a sidewalk on in front of their property right now, I can tell you that uh, I, it is my responsibility to do the upkeep. You have to shovel and, it in the winter. Yeah. Well, and if I want, if it gets to where it is right now and it has cracks on it, it is my responsibility to then replace that sidewalk. So, as as a person who lived there, I would be going, thank you, because sealing. Asphalt. Sealing asphalts are easier than just Very going out there with your bags of quickcrete or bringing in a concrete truck. Yes. Plus, I, I want to make a point. You remember those shoes, the Heelys? <laughs> with the little wheels on the back and you could oh, skate yeah. with your yeah. shoes? Well, I had a pair of those when I was 12. <laughs> and it is very hard to skate. On, on, the concrete. So- on the con- yeah. concrete sidewalk. You almost say cement. You've got all, those, expan- cement. You've got all those expansion joints. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's really right. hard. But <laughs> on the cement, it'd be awesome. You could skate right. for days. So the uh, the next controversy that we have. So, and- so this the, the conversation we want to have, though, is, all right, you ingrateful people. <laughs> 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 you turds. Would you rather not have any walking path at all, or would you rather have something... That allows you to get go downtown. You have, you know, if you and your husband wanted to take uh, to travel by uh, in not a car, so on foot or on wheels, you would now have a path that connects you to downtown Newcastle to Salt go to our day. biggest park to go to downtown. In a wheelchair asphalt it, would be a lot easier. Exactly. Yes. Um, you know, I can. Same I, thing as the wheelie shoes. A, a wheelchair. That's true. That's true. Asphalt would be easier. Uh, Kirsten Cronk, a listener, Patreon uh, subscriber, she says that. The stroller for her child uh, rides like a dream on the asphalt. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I bet. Yeah. I bet. It's nice. These guys. That, uh, Jared, where are the wait. age group of these people complaining? <laughs> are they like, do they actually go outside? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just. I'm just asking for a friend. Now, you know I'm on the ballot in a couple of months, right, Chase? And I'm, I'm trying not to. <laughs> All right, Dakota, what is the age group for these people? 
I, I can't say most of them don't have actual profile pictures. <laughs> <laughs> there are there's a certain contingent of people that no matter what you do, any improvements that you make is is wrong and we shouldn't do it. And, Why do you and, keep trying to change things in Henry County? <laughs> we're good enough like we are. That's just the reality of what Put the dough boy back where it belongs. <laughs> um I'm happy we have them. I, is it perfect? Probably not. But we are also just throwing rocks at glass houses before a project is even complete. People were mad about the seating. They're, they're still actively working on the project. It's not done. And uh, calm down. I, I, it's going to be better. People are saying that their their property values are going down because they have a sidewalk in front of their home now. Oh my. It's yeah. crazy. We we are full of... Come on. Donnie, come spend some time in Henry County. Donnie, if you we have a lot of fun here. If you ever watch Parks and Recreation, the people of Newcastle are like the the town goers in, in Parks and Recre- Parks and yeah. Recreation that would just yell about. Sir, yell so about, what exactly are you afraid of? I don't know. I'm just scared. <laughs> 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 they found a sandwich in the park and it had mayonnaise on it, and they don't like mayonnaise, and that's their problem. All right, the other major controversy we had this week. Oh, Jer. Uh, Monday night. The uh, Je- Councilman Jeff Hancock, who uh, who runs the greatest Jiffy Lube in the history of all Jiffy Lubes in, on State Road 3 in Newcastle. I'm sure he appreciates that. He ma- he changes my oil in my company car all the time. Or his people do. He doesn't do it himself. Jeff doesn't have to get his hands dirty. He's an executive, okay? Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> hi, Jeff. Um, the Newcastle Theater, the movie theater, is it's an old historic thing. Uh, Chase and I went to a movie uh, last year because my wife refuses to go see Star Wars movies with me. Chase and I go to those together. It, it wasn't last year. It was, it was this summer. This, year. Yeah. this summer, you and I went to this the summer. to the historic Castle Theater before it, it closed. It was awful. And there were like, <laughs> it was you, me, and three couples that talked through the whole movie. No, okay. There are a total of six people, people in the theater. Seven if you include the worker. <laughs> Two are these really old people that talk nonstop throughout the whole movie. He they were old, an- so they talked loud, he right? He answered his phone, and he said, hey, hold on a minute. I thought he was going to take it outside. He didn't. He it- kept having the conversation <laughs> during the movie. <laughs> and then, like, a mother and son who started out behind us, but the people were talking so loud, they had to move all the way in the front of the theater. It was. It smelled weird. And then, <laughs> so take this and take your experience and then compare that to the experience that you can have in Muncie where you can walk exactly. in to a 10-screen a, a, a 10 theater and you can get a drink, you can get a beer, a reclining, gin and tonic. Reclining uh, yeah. chairs. Nobody Go has in. any business drinking spirits or beer in a movie theater. Oh, no, Come you on can now. there. And I'm listen, telling you right now. I was very bummed out the first time the castle closed. Like, what was that, 10 years ago? Sure. Like, 2012? I was bummed out then. But, you know, after that, I was okay with it. We so, went to Monty, so, it was So, fun. Monday, Monday we found out that uh, Jeff Smiley, local businessman who owns Northfield Park, where the YMCA is and where the Farm Bureau building is, he has entered an agreement with a movie developer that they're going to bring in a 8 to 10 screen movie theater here in Newcastle, which of course has been controversial because, damn it, we can't have anything new. Well, I saw, and this might have to be a tinfoil time episode, that there has to be something going on because there's no way that it was just circumstance that the Castle Theater closed Uh-oh. and this got announced just a week later. So, yeah. <laughs> you know there's a, there's conspiracies cooking up that to Jeff Smiley, nobody, he, was, he was in the pockets of these people. Nobody needs to watch 10 movies at one time. Don't, one one screen yeah. is enough, Dakota. You don't need choices. What makes me mad is the people who complain about it closing down never went there. No, no one ever went there. Yeah. They wouldn't if it opened up again. Yogi Berra if, said nobody went there. It's too busy. If they had been going there, it wouldn't have closed. Exactly. exactly. Donya, what's the movie, th- <laughs> m- movie theater experience in, uh, in Crawfordsville? Is there one? Do you guys yeah. have one? Yeah, there is one. And I think they have, um, I haven't been there in a while. I'm trying to think, do they have? Don't let it close, Donya, <laughs> for the love of God. A couple of screens. I don't know. Well, I forgot why I decided not to go there anymore. I think it was something about the popcorn. I can't remember why, but we don't go there anymore. But um, <laughs> They angered her. Yeah, I don't know. They got me irate about something, and I'm old, and I forgot why. But uh, <laughs> so I'm one of those old people, Chase. But uh um, that's okay. <laughs> I like you, but so. I don't. I don't look old, so I'm okay, right? Uh, but no, I, I. So there is there is a, a movie theater there, and I think I, I think they have a couple of screens. It's not a big multiplex. The multiplex is in Lafayette, of course. So I live eight miles north of Crawfordsville. What thirteen miles south of the south edge of Lafayette? So 
I have choices if I go to Lafayette. Guess where I go to the movies? Lafayette. You bet. There you go. You well, it, it's uh, it's optimistic. I, it's I'm a free excited. market, baby. I'm the excited for Henry County to have That's something right. come along. That's right. All right. Wow. But the the important lesson to learn is that all of these things that are happening right now are improvements. Mm-hmm. They are improvements that are happening in Henry County and Newcastle, which means that good things are happening, which means uh, and we were and we just talked with uh, John Kindred, who's going to be calling in uh, maybe next week to give us another update on the uh, the real estate agents, the real estate market in Newcastle. Things are looking good and we can keep on riding this wave as long as we don't elect people who have a negative outlook on our county and the things that are happening. Please do not let that happen. You want to drop names? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll keep the name dropping. I already got blocked from Facebook, so uh, Cade can't. Ta- Cade texted earlier. Cade Coger, and he said I can't comment because I've got a seventy-two hour ban on Facebook. So all he can do is text me. Poor Cade yeah. is uh, Cade's in Facebook purgatory. All right, we are about at that point of the show, Chase. You you need to show Donya how it's done. Final thoughts are coming up here. Okay, we have loaded the idea. Mm-hmm. of you having your very own show on well, a Saturday or Sunday morning here. When I was I when was given I was the idea. A young boy. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't going to be just me. It was you too, Jerry. Well, but it'll be the it'll be the Chase Payton show and you will have some Dakota or myself it, it some wasn't. Prof- some yes. professional. Okay, let's be honest. Chase Payton didn't have this idea. I didn't have this idea. <laughs> I agreed to it. I think it is a great idea. We're going to sell some stuff. Not me personally, but if you have something you want to sell, you know, whether it's a kid a dog. <laughs> We're not doing human trafficking. <laughs> a lawnmower. <laughs> I don't care if it's a bag of garbage. If you want to sell it, call in and we'll hook you up. So I don't. What's the name of that? What's the uh, What's the trade name? I don't know yet. So it's Tradio. It's Tradio. 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 You call, you call is, into the yeah. show and you say, "I want to sell my lawnmower, and I want forty dollars for it." And Chase writes down their phone number, and he repeats that. And then the next person calls in and says, "Hey, I want to sell my." Uh, my my seventy two Buick, and Chase says, "Okay, we got a seventy two Buick, and call this number." And then you just keep track of yeah. it, and people have some fun. I want to talk to some interesting people, but we do need to name that's, it. That's one of the most um, uh, popular shows on our radio station back home. Exactly, my yeah. parents never missed it. I mean, you know, got to listen and see. And if they and my dad ever had a goat for sale or whatever, he always called it. It was the trading post on the, their. I'd the love to post. sell someone a goat. So, so Donya, imagine how much better that could be. With Chase sitting right, right where Jeremiah is sitting. With video, I'll wear a cowboy yes. hat live on, on video. On Facebook. You could bring the goat in here. Oh, I you will could model have the goat. Milk a goat. Don't. I, I'm not going to milk it. Donya, I've Chase, got if you bring a goat in the I studio, have, I used to have a herd of dairy goats. Milking <laughs> goat. We we could do. Uh, it, it, Brent Spicer's in the miniature chat, and he ponies. says, "Ponies, I can just see it all." Now he says it could right be the Saturday morning chaser. I would sell a miniature pony. I'd even i I'd ride it for someone just to show it off. Right, right. But parade You know, I'm thinking what maybe once, twice a month. I'm not doing it every week because I have commitment we'll issues. We'll see. But <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> Katie Larson's mentioned that. <laughs> but no, I'm I'm excited. You know, maybe right. we'll start it sometime. I like soon. that. I like Brantley's idea of the Saturday morning chaser. Oh, I like okay. it. Oh, there you go. Maybe or Sunday morning. We'll see. So you're on board. I'm on board. It's gonna happen. I don't know when. I'm it's gonna say early December, can, maybe yeah. mid November, early and, uh, December. That, uh, that works for me. Jeremiah and I already talked about it. We're gonna n- take turns uh, producing for you Thanks, because man. we don't want to get burnt out. <laughs> I, I, <don't> <laughs> I want to be uh, able to call in and sell some stuff. I got things to go. Jeremiah's gonna do it the weeks that Audrey and I don't do Tim Foil time. No, okay. maybe that's what we'll do. I think this has got possibilities. I t- I think it's got a lot of possibilities. And you can always tip Chase. Yeah, I I do accept tips. So I, I want to ask you, you you were not at the We're Libertarians party I was on Saturday not, night. I was in Chicago. You went to Chicago. Yes. And you were going to ask Katie a question. <sighs> it wasn't that question. Oh. So anyways, we took the train in. Oh, and, did you? Yeah, we took the train in, which How was, was the train? a good call. It, it wasn't you bad. took Amtrak out of Indianapolis? No, we uh we drove up to the dunes. Okay. And then we... And you took the South Shore line in. Yes. Oh, nice. That would it, be a good trip. Yeah, it was nice. It was, it was like an hour. And then it takes you right into the middle of the city. And you get out. I was a little overwhelmed at first. I was like, where am I? <laughs> There's so many this people. This is a whole new world. Is this your first time in Chicago? No, I've been multiple times. I've been to New York City. But for some reason, I was a little overwhelmed. I think it's because this was the first time when I was like on my own. I didn't have my parents with me. 
<laughs> so we well, went to go see the bean, which was awful. Dakota so and I went. People. So Dakota many and I people. went in January, and it was way, very, very few people. Way overrated. But the lake was a big block. It's and then Chicago, Chicago in the winter time is the best time to go to Chicago because there's no one around. Well, and it's yeah, because they beautiful. die. <laughs> yes, it's beautiful in the winter. Chicago is absolutely beautiful in winter time. I thought we could be friends, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. So she's it's over. <laughs> she's got Georgia blood, Dakota. That's not oh, happening. So then my girlfriend decides she's hungry. So Dakota had mentioned this chicken place and i was like hey we should go try that did you walk there we walked there from the bean yeah. mind you we had our backpacks with all our clothes in did it. you bring your weapon i thought it, i pulled it up on my phone and it said a 10 minute walk it was not a 10 <laughs> wrong, minute walk no it wrong. was like a mile and a half to two miles away it was awful we were sweating she was pissy at me but it, and once we got there it was really nice though really good chicken the neighborhood's not that great no, it's like they've started developing it a little bit more now, but it, it's what's definitely the place you guys went to? up and coming neighborhood. I mm-hmm. see. Um, when I was there, they had the Harvest Fest, so it was like uh, just a was hipster little Sebastian area. there. Well, yeah, it, it's the Harvest turn- Festival. I've never, I, I didn't hear about the Harvest Fest. We were just up like last month. Yeah, and we walked three miles to Gus's. Oh. So I would take your one and a half and. Double it. Well, see, on the way back, by the way, chicken was great. It was spicy. I knew it was going to be good as soon as they offered me honey. Yeah. And then I was like, okay. Did you get the collard greens? I didn't. How, how I'd sh- already eaten tell, by the time. Tell me about South South chicken, Danya. How, how, should, how should chicken be prepared? What's fried. what's good? Yeah, fried chicken. Fried. Should it have honey on it? Yeah, oh, it's, good. it's up to you. I guess. Spicy I fried know. chicken with honey do. is delicious. Mm. It's so good. It sounds good, but. Do you need waffles? Yeah, Oh. No, it's okay. pressure cook. I do love waffles. Gravy. So they they pressure cook it first, okay. and then they deep fry it in okay. this in like a I don't. It's got to be animal fat because it's definitely not peanut oil. Yeah, and it's if it's good, it's probably lard. Yeah, so and it's very spicy, and then they you can drizzle it with some honey, no. and you get that spicy oh, that and good. sweet. So and spicy. All right. we had that, and then I was like, we're not walking again. So we Ubered, which Uber was. Yeah, you can't cheap. walk after eating Gus's, I'll yeah. tell you that. Uber was relatively cheap. I think it was cheaper than in Nashville. Yeah. Um, like you ever paid for a single Uber on our Nashville trip? paid for a lot of Ubers <laughs> on the Nashville trip. Thank you very much. <laughs> when I was sober enough to order one, I was ordering one. <laughs> so we Ubered to the, the Field Museum, and we saw a couple mummies. You saw the mummy, and you saw, did you see, uh, what's the name of the dinosaur from South Dakota that's there? Oh, uh, Jess? No. Or something? It, the T-Rex? Yeah. It's in the lobby. Uh, we did see that, but Sarah they had moved it that. to a different place. Really? Uh, but we did get it's to see It's a very famous it. dinosaur. Do you, know this, do you know the answer, Danya? No. It's a girl name. <sighs> Sue. Sue. There it is. Uh, Sue. I did know that. See? It's in the back of my brain. They found it in the Badlands. That's right. Or in uh, uh, that South, was pretty Southwest cool. South Dakota. The mummies were pretty cool. And then you, you followed my recommendation? Uh, yes. I and followed you went your recommendation. To Second City. That's what we did that night. It was an improv show. It was really funny. So that was that was my Chicago trip. Was it a show or was it all improv? It was all improv. Really? Yeah. Do you see anybody think he's going to be famous? Did you say that's the funniest person I ever saw in my life? A couple people. Yeah. Like at least three of them. Did you sit up close? We were relatively close. We were like center in the middle of the stage, a couple rows back. And we had a table. So it was like the perfect spot to be in. Awesome. Did you get involved in the show at all? Did you no, I did not want to be. <laughs> okay. So the guy started walking off stage and we made eye contact and I just gave him the, the, the creepy eyes and I was like, don't come at me, bro. <laughs> and he walked the other direction. Comedy is one of my favorite things and Sarah's as well. So have you ever been to Second City in Chicago? No. So it is where the, I, a I lot know, of the Saturday I know, Night Live oh, I know, come from. I know Second City, but yeah. I, I used to watch, uh, actually, Second City had a TV show. Yes, uh-huh. absolutely. And, a CTV uh, oh, out of yeah, Canada. Yeah, I used to watch it. Rick Moranis and uh, uh, Dave yeah, Foley cool. and those yeah. guys. It's insane yeah. on how many famous people came out of there. Though. Oh, yeah. You, you look at their, their list of oh, alumni and it it's, is unreal. It's like a who's who. Of, yeah. Yeah, of, of sketch comedy, Steve yeah. Carell, and you know, just it, it just it, it's uh, everybody. It's phenomenal. I also had some good pizza. It was it was a good trip. Good so trip. Uh, I I definitely want to go back. Dakota and I have talked about going back. Where'd you go to get January. pizza? I don't remember the name of it. it Did you go I to guess, Exchequer? What Exchequer? It, it was wasn't Exchequer. It was Home like in. Papa John's. La, it was La. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. That's all right. Katie will comment eventually. The two that I like are Exchequer and um, Home yeah. Run In. 
and they're very wildly different. The Exchequer is the classic like bread lasagna style pizza. Yeah, the deep Just dish. A, yeah, mm-hmm. crazy deep dish. And then Home Run In has an ultra thin crust. Ooh, that's like it. It. Just See, like I feel like you go to love... Chicago for the deep dish, though. But I love thin crust pizza. Me too. And I've I used never to go for the Giordano's. Now we got it in Indy. I'd much rather have like New York style pizza than Chicago pizza. All right. Are you done with your final thoughts? Yeah. Uh, last one. <laughs> Browns play tonight. You think they're going to get their first one, Jerry? Yes, I do. They're going to beat the Jets. They're the going to beat the Jets. They're going to crash. The beer fridges are going to open all across the city, and there's going to be a lot of drunk driving. Fun times in Cleveland tonight. Yes. All right, that's it. All right, Donya. That's pretty much how it's done. We like to keep it a little tighter than that, but Chase was mm-hmm. all over the place. Do you have anything to promote? Did you say Cleveland earlier? Yeah, Cleveland over New York. Okay. The Browns. The Browns. Cleveland Browns. I haven't won a game in two years. Cleveland rocks. Hmm. Yeah, but they didn't lose a couple weeks <laughs> they, ago. So yeah, they good. tied. I want to promote that. Uh, okay, if, he, if he's going to be doing a show. Absolutely. <laughs> This whole idea of me doing my own podcast and telling stories because I, you know, I, I, are they scary stories? No, they're funny. (laughs) I am a funny woman, dude. People like me. And they laugh at my stories because I've led an interesting life. No doubt. And a funny life. So no telling stories because as you mentioned, that Southern accent, people like to listen and, and uh, people don't read, you know, people are, I mean, we've dumbed down America. Nobody reads. So I, I like, I love to write, but I think people would uh, be more engaged if they listened and I could engage an audience for my writing. So stay tuned. All right. Well, yeah. we will give we'll you, help you out. all of the knowledge we can, Donya. Well, when I get my uh, first book, I want to come here to promote it. We so will have you back on, I'll no be doubt. back, yeah. Uh, as long as you make the drive. But we I'll can have you here. back. We I'll can give here. you some very basic equipment list and things mm-hmm. to get to get you started. And yeah. You don't have to have the camera and the lights and the, the studio and all that. You can... Uh, you, you need get that started. little yeah. box. You need I, little, got a, I got a creepy H6. attic I could set up real uh, something really well. You know, it, it'd be like all dark and just except my lights. This, you, know? uh, you you're experiencing the new studio now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't believe the number of high profile candidates and sitting st- state legislators that came into Dakota's third third bedroom uh, on the second floor mm-hmm. of, a, of a home somewhere north of Q Avenue in Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, it's it was amazing, crazy. but yeah. uh, it happened. That uh, was a selling feature. That's right. To sell the house. It's like, hey, yeah. you know, State Senator Mike Kreider. <laughs> How many here. people been here? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like Motown to me. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. this house is got to have. It's going to have one of those little, uh, little plates on the, the front, the little yeah. plaque out yeah. front that says, "This is the original home." And it's here someday, in someday it, here in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> you need to develop the plaque. See, that's I should. You I should really do. You should start. You know, with it, while while it's all fresh and you've got so all before, the lists. So before before I sell Mark, it, and Mark Sean Orr is going to be raising money to put a plaque in front of your old house. Well, before I sell it, before I leave, I'm going to tap Connor. The a inaugural, brass plate inaugural in the basement. studios, the, the the site of the founding of the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast. Exactly. Exactly. Here well, on these grounds. This is it. Is. <laughs> yeah. Jeremiah lost the backside of his hand carrying a washer and dryer. <laughs> <laughs> the boss himself <laughs> shed his blood here. <laughs> washer and dryer included. I, yeah. I, I caused a number of property damage incidents. You saw me open a beer here in the mess I made tonight. So. Mm-hmm. You his can mother, only imagine. His own mother calls him a bull in a china shop. Oh. <laughs> so I, Donya chose to sit next to me on a plane once. Can you believe that? <laughs> no. On purpose. That's why, that's why whenever someone said that uh, the the asphalt for those new mm-hmm. sidewalks was uneven, Jeremiah's like, I walked on it and I didn't trip. And I was like, well, if you walked on it and didn't trip, then. <laughs> that's an incredible <laughs> testimonial, right? Exactly. I'm, I am injury prone and I didn't notice any problem. Yeah. So these people are just throwing rocks. All right. Uh, so we're going to check out Danya's podcast when we get that started. Dakota, final thoughts from you. My final thoughts are, of course, to uh, thank every single one of our Patreon donors. You are the people who keep this studio up and running. You literally keep the lights on. Um, we used to joke and say that they kept the lights on, but now they actually do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you to every single one of uh, you people out there that are giving us money every month. Um we are making great strides in the studio. Uh, Don, we have a sink now. It we doesn't have, have a drain, but damn it, no, we have a sink. We have no a, drain, sink. But a sink. I, I was here putting up, uh, I, I only got one blanket hung from the ceiling, but I was putting up some soundproofing tiles in the hot spots today. So hopefully the audio is a little bit better than episode 77. Next week on Tinfoil Time, if you wanted to, I can give you a little uh, 
premonition here. Uh, if you want to jump on the Patreon and catch next week's Tinfoil Time, we are going to be covering Denver International oh Airport. Oh, boy. I thought that you just promoted that for this last week. Nope, but we decided to change it because of Audrey's uh, new job. Is there I'm, a last week? There No, there's not a last week. I've Tim read Paul a little bit about this place, and it's pretty scary. Denver International yeah. Airport? There's something it's going supposed on supposed to be there. built by the Illuminati. They built it like an hour and a half out of Denver, I heard. There is a space lizard lair underneath it. There's some really weird pictures. Yeah. I've been there. Okay. I never know. So we're going to we're going to be doing a deep dive <laughs> into that and giving you guys the uh, the true story, just the facts like what uh, Donnie was talking about today. So from my end, we have uh we have to thank Donya for coming and for following the the I don't know if it's an expectation, but it's certainly it's certainly something we appreciate of bringing a gift, uh, our guests bringing gifts. She brought us a poster of Bobby Knight wearing Purdue gold. That is, I've got mixed feelings I'm about that. Done that you don't have it on the air. Well, go get that, Chase. We grab that I, real I've quick. I've got I'll, mixed I'll feelings it. about I'm, it. Yeah. Yeah. Don, Daniel will get it, or Chase me. will get it. Chase doesn't have the headphones on because okay. we because go. we don't have enough Patreon subscribers to buy <laughs> Chase's <laughs> set of headphones. That we we got to get a sponsor for his. For so his we're gonna unfurl it, Chase. If you'll stand yeah. back behind us in front of the door, we can uh, we can yeah, show it to the to the world. The gift I brought. Danya has brought us. Chase says his father's gonna disown him. If you look on screen, it go. is it is the uh, the man who uh, who left. Man, he was only this is this is unreal. Bobby Knight player. left per, uh, left uh, left yeah, IU. They, I think in two thousand. So Dakota would have been six years old when when Bobby coached his last game at IU. Oh my! Isn't that unreal? Yeah. So he doesn't, and, he doesn't and, remember and the you've had, all that this. You've had a relationship with him of sorts. He you no. you ran the. The fish fry. Yeah, but I didn't arrange that one. Okay. I, we're, I, I, we're I wasn't give you credit. In, yeah, well, I wasn't involved in making those calls. I did meet him, and uh, he <laughs> you know, put his arm around me or something. I don't know, but that, uh, I guess, he's a big guy. The uh, the Ag Alumni, uh, every year there's a big event. It's usually at the State Fairgrounds. The That's fi- correct. It's called the Fish Fry. The Ag Alumni Fish Fry. And it's a fundraiser. No. And Bobby, or a it, it, appreciation, it's a gathering, uh, yeah. a gathering, uh, to a celebration oh, of agriculture. Tell me, you don't shake them down for money at some point, at some level? No, never. No, that's wow. A, it's, it's a safe a, place. It's a it's a cost, man. We shake everybody down for money. <laughs> we, I wish it made. I wished for twenty eight years it made money, but I can't uh, believe you guys never shook them down. No, no, but it, it's a great thing. But no, he and Gene Katie. Now Gene Katie, who I do have a wonderful relationship with. Uh, uh, old friend and i appreciate his uh, in fact uh, texted him this past weekend he signed a basketball for a donor to the 4-h foundation for us so. very cool yeah he's a really great guy who still takes care of all of our people and he's he's pretty close with the purdue basketball program again now that matt painter's there and he's uh, oh yeah and uh, one of his guys is coaching well the team. And seeing he was back in town this weekend they brought him back um uh, uh from because he had to leave myrtle beach to be safe he was going to stay and uh, it's actually a um uh Ag supporter uh, Todd Reed from down in Greensburg, who flew him out of uh, Myrtle Beach last week, and he stayed till I think Tuesday. Maybe he went back home. Very cool. Yeah, so he was in town for the football game. So we thank we thank Donya for that. We are going to find a place to put that on display in the studio. Very excited about that. That is definitely our biggest poster we've had. We have a few that are around, but uh, that is the largest gift we have received so far. Okay, in size. Awesome. Uh, next week's show. We have uh, Nan Polk and Kathy Hamilton coming on. Nan is with the uh, the newly reformed Henry County League of Women Voters. Uh, so Nan will be on with us next week, and then Kathy Hamilton is working with uh, the Hope Expo or the Hope the Hope's uh, initiative. The Hope Initiative. There, thank you. Uh, and the uh, Henry County Expo Center, which is going to be the uh, the new Henry County Fairgrounds that we're building. Oh, great! Uh, so they are they kicked off their capital campaign last night. Uh, it's about a $5 million project. They need to raise about $3 million to complete the project and, and get to where we have no debt when that's built. So Kathy's going to come on and explain that. And much of the extension program that we've talked about tonight is going to take place in that building. Uh, once we move to Memorial Park, the uh, the Henry County Purdue Extension Office is going to be located there. And that program awesome. is going to take place in that space. And it's going to be uh, absolutely first class. Uh, Hamilton, not Hamilton County, Hendricks County, Indiana, has a very similar facility uh, with an all super all, fairgrounds yeah, yeah. That with their mm-hmm. fairgrounds that's the type of environment we're looking at for henry county uh, it's going to really really be an impressive 
impressive thing. We have Ivy Tech here now. We have a, a, a first-rate YMCA, and when this Expo Center is built, it's going to be a big deal. Yeah, great um, events, a, a great event space. Yes, it's going to mm-hmm. be there for trade shows, proms, <clears throat> weddings, dinners, and it will also be home to 4-H and in all yeah. in the in and the serving the youth of the community, not just 4-H, but across the board. So right. big thing. We're excited to have Kathy on next week. Total self-promotion on my side. Yard signs came in for the county council race. So if you live in Henry Township or somewhere with high traffic areas, send me a DM on Facebook or uh, email me, jeremiahmoral at gmail.com or jeremiah at Balls, Hogger, Liberty, and uh, we'll hook you up with some And just signs. as a reminder, if this video gets 50,000 views, Jeremiah will get a Boss Hog of Liberty tattoo somewhere visible on his body. You always bring that up. Mm-hmm. I'm voting for like his ring finger on his right hand. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. I, I want to get the moral crest at some point. I have zero tattoos, so this is a big in, this is a big one for me. He but said I, that after we after an episode reached a thousand um, downloads, uh-huh. he would get one. And now that we've had multiple episodes reach a thousand downloads, he still doesn't he have a tattoo. Nobody oh. believes you have a thousand. I, I need to hear video evidence of that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. You Thank- just told her before the show started. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I've told you a million times not to exaggerate, Dakota. We will see you guys next week with uh, with Nan and Kathy and who knows who else. Thank you, Donnie, for being here. My pleasure. We'll catch you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Boss Hog of Liberty, which is part of the We Are Libertarians Network. I am Chris Spangle, and I am the founder of this network. And I invite you to listen to all of our shows, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com or by searching for these in your podcatcher. The flagship show is the We Are Libertarians podcast, where we apply libertarian principles to current events. The Brian Nichols Show is a conversation amongst Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, as they talk about what is happening in the news. And we have many other podcasts like The Chris Spangle Show, Upward, The Cost, Raw Audio Politics, Miranda's World, and Tad Talk, which is quite a ride. So check all of these out. Go to wearelibertarians.com and you can check out all of our great podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Get our other shows at wearelibertarians.com.